time of flight mass spectrometer does exactly what the name would suggest. It is able to measure the mass of a sample which might be composed either of um, atoms or molecules. It's a very straightforward process. We find that the sample is firstly ionized uh, to form cations or positively charged ions. This can happen in two ways either by use of an electron gun or through um, electrospay ionization. I can't say that, electrospray ionization. I'll talk about those two in particular in a minute. The cations are then, so there's our sample. At this point, it has been ionized, so we could call it X plus. This whole thing is taking place in a vacuum, um, ions are in a gaseous state. They're then accelerated by an electric field into the flight tube and they drift across the flight tube until they hit the detector. When they hit the detector, our positive ions pick up electrons and this causes a current to flow and the size of the current is directly proportional to the number of ions, which means that our mass spectrometer does not only measure mass, but it is also able to uh, measure the percentage abundance. Very really useful information. Let's go back to stage two. When our ions are accelerated, they're accelerated so that they all have the same kinetic energy. When they move into the drift region, we can time, in stage three here, we can measure the time taken for them to drift through the drift region and hit the detector. So um, we can measure time taken. Time taken measured in seconds to drift from one end of the uh, drift region of the flight tube to the detector depends on two things. It depends on the distance travelled, and that's measured in metres, and the velocity, which is measured in metres per second. Now we know that the distance travelled, let me just change my colour here, that the distance travelled is going to be constant because the length of the flight tube is constant. That isn't changing. So the time taken to drift across the drift region depends essentially on the velocity. Now the velocity of our ions can be um, linked back to their kinetic energy. Okay, so let me just get rid of that. So what do we know? We know that the kinetic energy of our ions is equal to half mv squared, where v is velocity. m here is the mass of the ions in kilograms. I know it sounds heavy, but we need to convert everything that, so that uh, we can make this work. And kinetic energy is in joules. Let's rearrange that so we have velocity. So if I rearrange that, the velocity is equal to the square root of 2ke over m. You need to be able to do this. Okay, so let's just make that really clear. You need to be able to rearrange to form this expression here given ke equal to half mv squared in an exam situation. So what does all this really mean? Well, the time taken to, for our ion to drift across the flight tube depends on the distance, which is constant divided by the velocity. We also know that the kinetic energy of all our ions is constant which means that the 
time taken for our ions to drift across the tube depends on the velocity and the velocity depends on the mass because kinetic energy is constant and the length of the flight tube, the distance traveled, is constant. So pulling all that together, what we know is that the time taken for our ions to drift through the drift region along the flight tube is proportional to the square root of the mass of the ions. So lighter ions are going to travel faster. They're going to hit the detector quicker. So our mass spectrometer is essentially ionizing our sample, accelerating our ions. They separate themselves out through the drift region depending on their mass and the detector measures how many ions we have and the mass. So going back to the first stage ionization, this can happen by two methods. We're going to have a look at the first one here, um, and that is by electron impact, which is also known as electron ionization. This is very straightforward. Essentially, our sample, our sample is vaporized, so it's in the gaseous state. It is bombarded by high energy electrons so that our sample, whether it was originally made up of atoms or molecules, now become positively charged cations. And so we know that these can be accelerated by an electric field into the drift region and then they can hit the detector. Sometimes you see this equation simplified simply as it is just the sample forming ions plus an electron, the electron that was knocked out. Uh, the setup for this, again, if you ask to draw it, very straightforward. So we have got our electron gun. Okay. Our electron gun. Let me write that down. Our electron gun uh, is simply a hot wire filament with a current running through it that emits electrons. So sometimes this is labeled simply as the hot wire filament. And we need a positively charged plate to attract the electrons. So the hot wire filament is emitting these very high energy electrons. And then our sample is introduced in the gaseous state. Electrons are knocked off it. And so we have our ions. A very straightforward process there. We need to be aware that if we use electron impact and our sample um, consists of molecules rather than atoms, we often get fragmentation. So what do I mean by that? So molecules can be fragmented. Well, if you think about it, if we take a molecule and we bombard it with high energy electrons, it's not surprising the molecule might fall apart, i.e. fragment. Let's take ethane, for example. I'm going to write it out, not as C2H6, but as CH3CH3. So the most straightforward thing that happens that our high energy electrons hit our ethane and they knock out an electron to form a positively charged ion. Okay, and this can be picked up by the detector. However, it's equally possible that the high energy electrons actually smash the molecule up. So we end up with what, two fragments, one of which has had an electron knocked off it, one of which is essentially a radical and not picked up by the detector, um, and our two electrons. Okay, so let's be clear, only one fragment. Um, picks up the positive charge or becomes the cation. Okay.
So what does this mean? It means that the spectrum, so let's have a look, that our detector produces can actually be quite complicated when we're looking at molecules rather than um, atoms or elements as a sample. So we have intensity on the y-axis. Sometimes this is known as percentage abundance. Sometimes this is known as relative abundance. So this y-axis can be labelled all sorts of things. And then on the bottom, we have the mass charge ratio. Now, since we're assuming that only one electron has been knocked out, we assume that Z, which is the charge, is always plus one. So we can essentially ignore that. So this bottom axis is essentially the mass of the ion that hits the detector. So for this example here, I would expect to have a peak at a mass of 15, and that's because we've got the CH3 fragment here. 15, because carbon has a mass of 12, and we've got three hydrogens in this fragment. So that adds up to 15. And I would also expect to see a peak at 30, which corresponds to molecules that are not broken up and are simply ionized. This is often called the M plus or the molecular iron peak. And essentially, this is the important bit of information. This gives us the MR for the molecule. The second method that we can use to ionize our sample is electrospray ionization. This is also known as soft ionization because it's very rare for it to cause our sample to fragment. This is really useful when we want to find the molar mass for big molecules like proteins. We need the whole molecule to hit the detector. We don't want it breaking up into thousands of small fragments. So essentially, the sample is dissolved in a volatile solvent. So dissolved in So volatile means um, a substance that easily um, evaporates. So we are thinking water, perhaps, or methanol are good examples. And it is injected into the chamber with, via a hollow needle. And this hollow needle here is attached to a high voltage power supply. The result is that the sample picks up a proton. So here's our sample. It picks up a proton from the solvent, uh, X, H, plus, to form our cations. So this is a proton, and that's picked up from the solvent. And the solvent itself simply evaporates so that it is these charged particles here that are then accelerated into the drift region before they hit the detector. We need to be aware that when we are looking at the mass spectrum using this method, so here we have got intensity or relative abundance here we've got our mass charge. Um, let's take our example as ethane, uh, yeah, ethane again. So we have got ethane. In this method, it picks up a proton from the solvent. Uh, wait a minute, C, I'll the right straight, C2H7 plus. So on our mass spectrum, we are going to have a peak, and our peak is going to be at 31. So this is for C2H7+. So if I'm trying to find the um, 
molar mass of this particular uh, molecule. I need to remember to take one off for the extra proton that's been added. So the mass charge is 31. So the molar mass must be 30 because we have actually, we have removed in our analysis, we've removed the proton. So we need to be really clear about that. With electrospray ionization, all our peaks are plus one. We, we need to remove that H plus um, in order to work out the molar mass, which isn't an issue when we're looking at the mass spectrum um, and the sample has been ionized via the electron gun.